All right, welcome to another episode of the Gillette Health Podcast, and today we're going to be covering all things fat. We truly believe that food is medicine, and fat is just one macronutrient. Not all fats are created equal. Each has upsides and downsides, kind of like medications, in fact, and kind of like supplements, and kind of like carbs and proteins, etc. But we get a lot of questions regarding specific fats, saturated fat, fat in general, is all fat created equal? Should I eat more fat? Should I eat less fat? And we're going to do our best to dive into some of the specific high yield fats, which we think are useful for health purposes. Um, and uh, just talk about fat in general. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a really good discussion. And uh, we're going to try to be a little bit more reference heavy um, so that people can go and read about some of these things a little bit more on their own. Because I know a lot of our audience is a very intellectual and likes to look at the data for themselves as well. So I suppose we start with just kind of a macro level like dietary fat in general. So when we hear about this, there's kind of two buckets, people that are, you know, a low fat diet you know, and things like, you know, a secondary prevention of cardiovascular events, really looking for very tight lipid control, um, improving endothelial function, things of that nature. And then on the flip side of that, you have a like high fat, like ketogenic type of diet that people are doing or low carb diet that's typically going to be higher in fat. Um, and there's some benefits people point to there, like um, improved hormone profiles, typically testosterone in men, mm -hmm. um, you know, running on you know, ketones, um, at least in part, if not completely, instead of you know, glucose for brain fuel and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's certain populations that are going to benefit from you know, dietary fat being lower or higher. Um, but is fat evil? Is saturated fat evil? Um, what about the seed oils now that everyone's talking about. I mean, which one is the poison and which one is the magic bullet? Yeah, and the answer is none of them is the poison. The dose makes the poison. Omega-6s are certainly not evil. Seed oils have a lot of omega-6s. You have essential fatty acids and non-essential fatty acids. Your essentials are your omega-3s and your omega-6s. In developed countries, I, uh, you would be hard pressed to find someone who is deficient in omega-6s just because they are ubiquitous. Omega-3s, depending on the condition, for example, AFib risk or um, you know, cardiovascular risk, high triglycerides, optimizing specific ones like EPA and DHA can be particularly helpful, but that is also not without risk. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. We'll talk about the different risks. And one of the things I find interesting is you know, this sort of 10% threshold for saturated fat. 10% um, of your calories, you know, if somebody's eating 1,200 calories, that's a very low amount of saturated fat. If somebody's eating 3,000 calories, you know, that's a little bit, you know, more that they're able to intake. And I think that there's different individual thresholds on that just from the blood work that I've seen. You know, not everybody that's eating a lot of saturated fat do I see, you know, inflammatory markers and, um, you know, dyslipidemia, things going haywire in their metabolism. Um, I think there's a different threshold, just like we talk about the you know, fat threshold that people have as far as you know, how much visceral adiposity can you as a person tolerate? I think there's a similar thing for how much saturated fat somebody can intake before it is, you know, downregulating their LDL receptors in the liver to a significant extent where we see those other effects. Uh, and the epidemiology is very messy here. So if we look at like linoleic acid, there's some studies that track this, you know, and tell people eat a heart healthy diet, which mm -hmm. typically has more linoleic acid than um, saturated fat. And based on the amount of linoleic acid in their adipose tissue, they see the people that ate more linoleic acid versus saturated fat had less cardiovascular events. But then if you look at some populations who've had car cardiovascular events, you see, well, these people had more linoleic acid in their you know, fat cells or red blood cell membranes, whatever mm -hmm. it is. So it is very messy. And I think it's really just I think for 70% of the population, probably getting the amount of calories right is going to supersede whether you are getting, uh, supersede, <laughs> whether you're getting your dietary fat from seed oils or saturated fat. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Another note on linoleic acid, there's CLA, which is a conjugated form, and it is not useful as a fat burner, and neither is MCT, and neither is TTA, which we'll all dive into more later. One other note on fat in general is there's a specific type of fat called trans fat, which now has to be on nutrition labels. Um, of note, not all trans fat is bad, which I learned relatively recently in the stomach of ruminants. Mm 
So in like grass-fed beef, as an example, you have trans omega fatty acids that are formed naturally in the stomachs of ruminants. Mm -hmm. And uh, however, other trans fats in addition, like that are not those, um, are certainly um, detrimental to your health, especially in high amounts. Those are usually found in like uh, really crispy, for example, like pie crusts or uh, crispy cake toppings. Or margarine from the 80s that your parents still haven't thrown out. Yes. <laughs> yep. You don't want that. Yep. Lots of trans fats there. And CLA is also a product of ruminant animals, I believe. Um, is this omega-3 trans fatty acid different than CLA? So there's even more different fatty acids that are produced in these, mm -hmm. a certain environment. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of different fatty acids. I believe... Um, linoleic and linolinic are both essential fatty acids that are often produced um, from like both marine and from terrestrial animals. Yeah, and I think this is interesting because their digestive tracts are so much different than ours. And there's some data where you'll see, well, you know, humans can convert, you know, this to CLA and it's mediated by bifidobacterium strains, but it's really not a clinically significant amount from the papers that I've seen. We just, we don't have you know, multiple stomachs and we don't you know, have this rumination like the animals do. Yep. Uh, and something you said just now, I guess we can, you know, dive into it. It's a fun one. Um, you know, fat burners, you know, take X fatty acid or eat more fat to burn more fat. Um, why are people mistaken there? Because, I mean, if you eat more fat, aren't you going to be, you know, oxidizing more fatty acids? You're burning more fat, Kyle. Yeah, so there's a difference between, so th this term fat burners is really, um, misleading because there are things that you can take, whether it's a supplement or a medication or food that help you consume less calories. And that is how you're going to lose weight. There's also things that have a lipolysis benefit. So that help you break up fatty acids and utilize those fatty acids in your adipose tissue. And Occasionally, these things will also convert white fat to more metabolically active beige fat. So you have more beta oxidation. So some of these supplements do have a lipolysis benefit. Growth hormones actually similar in GHRPs. But that doesn't mean that they're helpful for weight loss. So it is misleading and also just wrong that they're marketed for weight loss. Yeah, and I see these ads all the time. Like you mentioned specifically CLA, it's marketed as a fat burner. You have companies selling it as a fat burner. Uh, maybe these people are going to be oxidizing more fat, but the outcome that they're interested in is losing body fat over a period of time. And unless the you know, calorie situation changes, then you're likely not going to see that outcome. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, people can have some recomposition in the right circumstances if they're you know, resistance training, have their protein intake where it needs to be and so forth. Um, and that lipolysis is really interesting. Um, I think that is part of the reason that, you know, the growth hormone is such a potent inducer of lipolysis. And I think that's part of why it induces the insulin resistance yep. in addition to increasing you know, insulin secretion. Um, and I remember this back in the hospital when you had people on you know, TPN and they're getting free fatty acids just right into the bloodstream and it induces profound insulin yep. resistance. And you're seeing that, you know, to a lesser effect. You know, I don't think anybody's running a glucose of 500 because of growth hormone at appropriate doses. But you do see some people who are, you know, particularly susceptible to getting some insulin resistance from mm -hmm. growth hormone. Yep. Um, fatty acids are generally broken down in a process known as beta oxidation, um, just to produce ATP, similar to how um, glucose produces ATP as well. And and a good rule of thumb is the more fat that is in your diet, the more beta oxidation you want to happen. However, if there's more fat in the diet, especially if they're in general relatively healthy fats from whole foods, that same fat that you're consuming will help you do beta oxidation more. So many fats do this, um, not just CLA, but also TTA. There's a system called PPAR, which is um, in your mitochondria. And um, these that PPAR is activated by many things. Fatty acids like TTA often activate them. And if it activates one PPAR, three of the major ones are alpha, gamma, and delta. There's also medications that activate these, for example, fibrates or even TZDs or uh, cartering, which was studied um, and did not pass clinical trials. But anyway, um, 
if that is the right limiting step, then it could be potentially beneficial to incorporate fats into your diet or supplements to help prevent things like fatty liver disease. Yeah, and the TTA is really interesting because it, at one time it looks like it was being developed as a drug target as a you know, PP, uh, PPAR alpha agonist. Um, PPAR delta agonism, I think, is where the you know, kind of cancer risk comes from. And anytime you have a strong agonist of that, like the carterine or even the TZDs, there's a little bit of a, a cancer risk there. Uh, but with the TTA, the, the, there was one clinical study, I think this was about a decade ago, and they saw that it did improve lipid profiles and I believe insulin resistance a little bit in a diabetic population. Mm -hmm. So I think that was around a gram per day, which is not a significant amount. You know, a lot of people take several grams of omega-3 fatty acids per yep. day. But it seems like it was kind of you know cut off in the pipeline. I don't think it made it past phase two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if it had any effect on like neoplastic risk at very high doses. Probably not. And it is the, the population that would potentially benefit would be one, people who are on very high fat diets like the carnivore diet. Early on in the diet, um, it's much easier to prevent things like fatty liver disease than to treat them. And then also people who are on high doses of L-carnitine because it helps the body use L-carnitine kind of synergistically in order to, beta, to have more beta oxidation. So uh, potentially people who are injecting L-carnitine, which we've talked about recently. Yeah, and some of the, the studies in preclinical literature uh, looking at TTA, I believe you mentioned, it, it's almost like it appears to be a shuttling effect where you use something like TTA and you see more carnitine or carnitine precursors going into the cell, mm -hmm. uh, presumably because you know there's a little bit of a limitation in the literature here. Um, and then other fatty acids potentially being shuttled into the cell as well. Um, in that clinical trial, they actually measured the omega-3 fatty acids in the blood and they saw mm -hmm. you know, 10 to 15% decreases in those. And is that because people are not absorbing them or because they're going into the cells or, or is it just you know, an artifact because it's just one study? Um, we really don't know, but it's interesting and it, it kind of lines up with some of that preclinical mechanism, um, just like the obese rats that are fed TTA, you know, it is very protective for their liver. Um, you know, not everything translates from the, the mouse studies, but there are specific populations you could say, oh, you know, based on what we know about the way this works and the mechanism, it would stand to benefit these people more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of the premise of individualized medicine, I suppose. Um, another thing on that note is that is another reason why we like to check intracellular red blood cell or white blood cell omega-3s. Otherwise, you can have a same in the previous night and your serum omega-3s will significantly change. Um, so that's something to think about. Just like if you're worried about insulin resistance or diabetes, you should take an A1C and not just a fasting glucose. Um, shifting gears to another note, ALA is another fatty acid that we get a lot of questions about, both our ALA and ALA in general. Um, there's a lot of potential risks and benefits, but um, how do we look at that in general? Yeah, so alpha lipoic acid, um, and basically if you want to get a lot of this in your diet, um, walnuts are a great source of that. Um, and what's most interesting to me about this one is that we have quite a bit of human data on it. It's been around for a long time, a lot of study. Um, and probably the most compelling evidence I see for like, oh, this person should supplement with ALA mm -hmm. uh, is in the type 1 diabetic population. Yeah, because, you know, uh, retinopathy, vision decline is very prevalent in type 1 diabetics, and alpha lipoic acid seems to ameliorate some of that, not just in preclinical models of so mice, but um, actually in, in people's visual acuity, um, contrast sensitivity, their ability to make out different um, shades of color and things of that nature. Um, and I don't know why this hasn't made it into the guidelines, because it's a fairly benign intervention um, and it has a lot of upside for type 1 diabetics. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe there are endocrinologists out there doing this, but, you know, all the type 1 diabetics I've seen, um, they have not been taking a, an ALA supplement. There's a little bit of data looking at maybe it helps to ameliorate some of the nephropathy that we see there, the mm -hmm. kidney issues that are caused by type 1 diabetes. But I don't think that's been, um, you know, there's not any long-term outcome studies there where we see, does it preserve EGFR, et cetera. Yeah. Um, it is not without potential downsides. There is some evidence that our ALA is better than a mixture of what I believe is the enantiomers of alpha lipoic acid. So in general, since there's not really a downside to our ALA, we generally go with our ALA, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to switch to that. 
and it doesn't necessarily mean getting a mixed and anti or supplement is detrimental. We get a lot of questions about its effect on the thyroid as well. And in general, uh, it is not particularly concerning for the thyroid. If you look at many supplements, boron, um, uh, cruciferous vegetables, lots of goitrogens, things seem like they would significantly impair thyroid function or even small amounts of um, iodine that the thyroid cannot use. Um, but in general, it's not clinically significant, although it might be statistically significant. Yeah, and this is just another reason for people, if they are taking something that has a potential either positive or adverse effect on the thyroid, you know, you're getting your about quarterly blood work seeing, you know, is this pushing up my TSH and does that trend continue? Yeah. So just because you see a bump doesn't mean, oh, I need to do a complete 180 in reverse course, but does that TSH go from three to five to seven to, you know, mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, and it's interesting, we see the same pattern as far as these you know, racemic mixtures and different isomers in supplement form, uh, and then also in the pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. It's not uncommon to see a medication that's a mixture come out, and then they you know, leave off half of it, and they say, okay, this mm -hmm. isomer is actually what's giving most of the benefit, um, and then we can avoid some side effects this way. And it just takes a little bit longer, but you do see the same thing in the supplement industry. Mm -hmm. Quick note on intracellular or intraconology of thyroid hormone. So like the converting of T4 to T3 inside the cell, there's three main deiodinase enzymes. The second one, which I think is five prime, three prime converts to reverse T3. And um, there are not many things, um, ALA included, that are concerning for down-regulating this intracellular conversion significantly, but two that are very likely significant, selenium, of course, and then vitamin D. So um, I would say look at those two things first if you're concerned about uh, like T4 to T3 or intracellular hypothyroidism. Yeah, those are great things to look at as far as people's micronutrient profile. Um, and then omega-3s is always a fun one to talk about because you hear people saying, well, everyone should be taking omega-3s. Um, I suppose the worst person to take omega-3s is someone who has a terrific cardiac risk profile a uh, strong family history of atrial fibrillation, yep. and hey, they have sleep apnea. Yep. So um, they're AFib, and sleep could potentially be worsened. AFib is probably the most prominent risk. Um, we mentioned high triglycerides as a good reason to optimize their omega-3 profile. Their ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s also matter. And then we, all, we already mentioned um, checking intracellular omega-3s, so you can't study for the test as much. Um, that being said, most people in developed countries, as Dr. Rhonda Patrick has mentioned, um, do not have an optimal omega-3 index, and there are many other benefits, for example, the insulin sensitization, leptin sensitization. Um, oddly enough, several fatty acids in the, in the list that we talk about are sold as like um, leptin sensitizers, um, which is interesting. Controlling triglycerides in general is likely the best leptin sensitizer. So there's not like a magical fatty acid that does it or doesn't do it. Um, but yeah, um, that's a general overview of omega-3s. Most people need to at least look at it, but not everybody should be on like four grams of EPA a day. Yeah, and the EPA, even though some of the data suggests that it, it causes a shortened sleep, people tend to have a little bit better energy profile with you know just EPA, even if their sleep is shortened from seven to six hours. Um, and then whether that's, you know, something that's beneficial long-term for people, I think remains to be seen. And then you kind of see the opposite if someone's doing just DHA. You see that that tends to lengthen the amount of time people spend sleeping. So if somebody's notoriously a short sleeper, um, they may not feel like they are more any more energetic, but you might extend that sleep window. And if someone's concerned, oh, I'm only getting, you know, five hours of sleep, I wake up in the middle of the night, DHA could be part of that. Of course, you're doing good sleep hygiene, other supplements that are known to improve sleep architecture. Um, but I think that's interesting. And, you know, the red blood cell omega-3, I think it, that's the gold standard at this point. Because when they've had the opportunity to do some tissue biopsies, like someone's having an open heart surgery, mm -hmm. say, well, let's see what the omega-3 index yep. or what tissue level looks like in the heart. It correlates very well with that red blood cell omega-3 index. Yep. I think that's particularly reassuring. Uh, in past podcasts, we've mentioned DHA's unique benefits, for example, in TBI or concussion healing. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, we've touched on it before. Does everybody have to take the superior triglyceride form or is ethyl esters okay? Yeah. And I think people are going to get about 80%, if not more of the benefit from an ethyl ester form. And if that's more affordable, 
you know, then even if you're not absorbing as much of it, you can take a higher dose and get the same effect. So at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. It's a matter of what mm -hmm. makes sense for somebody you know, financially and what's available to them. So, you know, if your triglyceride form is sold out or if it's cost prohibitive, then a omega-3 ethyl ester a lot of times can be very affordable from a, a pharmacy. So I don't know if the average, um, you know, GP out there is going to prescribe omega-3 ethyl esters, somebody who's looking for health optimization, but uh, it's, it's a compelling option because 25 cents a capsule beats a lot of things that are out there on the market right now. And you don't have to take eight capsules of fish oil that way. Yep. I think that is a, um, a very good way to look at it. Decreasing capsule load, decreasing pill fatigue. For any medication or supplement, this problem is the same. So for X medicine, for diabetes medicine X, should you take an injectable or should you take the oral form? Well, you should check the A1C and the fasting insulin and the, and the markers to see if it's actually working, regardless of which form you have. And then if it's not, you can switch. Yeah, absolutely. It, it just the objective data, get the blood work done. Um, one that we haven't touched on here was um, PEA, uh, and then it looks like we have MCT to discuss a bit. So PEA is an interesting fatty acid, and this one has a fair amount of research on it. Um, you know, I came across this looking at you know some studies in you know, pain management, and that mm -hmm. seems to be one of its most potent effects is that you know, it's been pitted head-to-head -head with things like ibuprofen, um, uh, Tylenol, I'm looking at people's pain levels and inflammation. Uh, it, it seems to have pretty consistent effects in terms of, you know, reducing pain, improving functionality. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that tons and tons of people have arthritis or tons and tons of people have occasional pain that they want to use an anti-inflammatory for, but they don't want to cause erosion of the stomach lining or kidney issues with popping an ibuprofen. Yeah. Ibuprofen does work very well. There's nothing wrong with taking one occasionally. Um, nephrologists are cringing right now. <laughs> But um, if you have something like PEA that has a pretty benign risk profile, um, then I think that makes sense for some people to you know, trial that and see, does it work for you? Because there is a robust body of clinical literature that acts this. Um, and I think there was also something with being incorporated into the fatty acid profile uh, of the brain or, or acting on cannabinoid receptors. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think you know a little bit more about this than I do. I've had a few reports of PEA being particularly helpful for sleep which you wouldn't know if that's primary due to its action on the endocannabinoid system or if that is secondary, just literally because less pain, better sleep, both um, like shortened duration of onset of sleep and better sleep parameters, but not on polysomnograms. This is usually on whoops or aura. So um, not sure like how much stock to put into it, but the biofeedback that I've had from multiple individuals who has tried theoretically makes sense. So I think this is one that makes sense to take in the evening. Gotcha. Yeah. So timing of certain supplements can be very important. Uh, and that brings us to, you know, MCT. So this has been marketed as all kinds of different things, a, a fat burner among those, which mm -hmm. I, I don't think is compelling. Um, but I have seen a number of people talking about MCT oil, uh, brain fog. Um, and what it looks like happens is you, intake MCT oil and due to its, um, the length of that fatty acid chain, it's pretty rapidly converted into ketones um, so that instead of running on glucose metabolism, you have your sort of you know, backup fuel supplies as it were. Mm -hmm. um, and then what's more interesting to me than that, even you know, somebody gets a subjective benefit, that's great. But we actually have, I think one study now that has a hard outcome measure where it did um, not just, um, for a short period of time, but I think it was about a 13 month period, uh, either stabilized or showed some slight improvements in Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. which is interesting because that's something that, you know, almost always shows a decline and you can show improvements if you just put somebody on a exercise regimen for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. um, but typically they're not following them out for that long period of time. Uh, and it wasn't an obscene amount of mm -hmm. you know, MCT oil. I think it was something you know, maybe 15 milliliters per day. That's, you know, somebody could put that on a salad. Mm. Um, and then it's not you know, an obscene amount of oil. So I think that's very interesting. I don't believe it's been replicated yet. Um, so that's one thing that I always look for. Like, is this just an artifact? Things do get retracted from time to time. But, you know, it is very promising because, you know, um, they sometimes refer to Alzheimer's as type 3 diabetes. And 
a lot of people cringe at that definition, but yeah. uh, it does seem pretty clear that there's some insulin resistance that is pathological in at least some of these cases. Mm -hmm. And another common question, yes, it can make a good carrier oil, um, <laughs> before people are typing in the comments. And um, no, it is unlikely that you will be injecting 15 mils like you might have on your salad. <laughs> so keep, keep in mind the dose that comes with the carrier oil. Of course, over time, volumes can add up. It does have a very thin viscosity at room temperature. It's still in the teens, which is uh, like half to a fourth of many other carrier oils like cottonseed and sesame and GSO. Uh, I think that's a pretty good overview. Um, maybe to circle back to the dietary fat in general for a moment. Um, yeah, we talked about leptin briefly. Um, and that's one of the things that leptin seems to more potently drive compared to other macronutrients. Like um, there's some data on protein potentially driving leptin, you know, satiety. Um, and then carbohydrates, there's data on both sides. It's really like, you know, the, it's probably artifact is what they're seeing in those studies. Mm -hmm. uh, but dietary fat seems to consistently increase that, um, particularly um, saturated fat. Um, and then polyunsaturated fats, not necessarily omega-3 fatty acids. Um, but you increase that leptin and, and why this would be therapeutic is in cases of like hypothalamic amenorrhea. So, you know, athletes amenorrhea yep. or even men who are you know, coming off of uh, testosterone, coming off of a cycle, and they want to restart their natural production. Yep. You want to get that pituitary signaling, you know, your prerequisite for that in order. Um, and it's interesting because we know that like either leptin or leptin analogs, yep. very successful in the clinical, the small trials that are there for you know, restoring menstrual uh, thyroid function, yep. markers of bone mineral resorption, which are secondary to the hormones, but yep. the you know uh, clinical practice guidelines in endocrinology right now, they still recommend against the use of any sort of you know, leptins or leptin analogs for these mm -hmm. things. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't manipulate your diet, push the fat a little bit higher in order to get that similar, maybe not quite as potent effect, but in any case, increase the leptin signaling that's occurring there. Yep. A lot of that theory is the, um, like the science behind why in cases like hypothalamic amenorrhea, since leptin binds the receptor on the hypothalamus, and it's also likely one of the causes of slightly early puberty, especially in more obese pediatric patients. Um, you think, put them on a bodybuilder diet, high fat, five or six meals a day, and you have a nice even bleed of leptin, kind of the opposite of intermittent fasting. Yeah, and it, it sounds contrary to what anyone would want to think about health. It's like these people are like, well, um, I developed this issue, so I need to double down on my health measures. Yep. Like maybe I need to exercise more or eat even healthier. And you know, it's really not the case in this unique situation. Um, so you know, obviously blood work is going to be diagnostic here. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure that it's not a you know, prolactinoma or a number of other cause thyroid issues that could be causing these you know, menstrual problems. But um, I think that's a particularly interesting clinical application uh, of dietary fat that I actually learned a lot about from you. Absolutely. And likewise. And I guess speaking of that, it is time for me to put MCT in my coffee or not. <laughs> and I think that's a pretty good summary. I think I'm going to put some seed oils in my coffee today. It sounds, sounds like a good idea. Maybe just machine lubricant and I'll cheers to that. I am the machine. All right. Well, as always, thank you for joining us. Um, hopefully this has given you some tools to develop a balanced approach to your own individual help, health. And as always, thank you for listening.